this is an exciting day. This is a day that's going to challenge you, help you grow, and I hope widen your experience of things. I want you to look at this picture. This is a picture taken not too long after the anniversary of this day. Uh, in 1945, on this very day, May the 8th, the Allies declared victory in Europe over the Nazis during the Second World War. It's this very day, 68 years ago. This guy was there. Now, obviously, he was much younger. He's there standing in front of a Spitfire in Ottawa. His name is Charlie Fox. And he looks, tell me what he looks like. He's proud. He's Air Force. He's also old, right? He's old. You don't relate to the Second World War. As far as you're concerned, it's probably like Roman history, ancient history, that far ago, right? But I'm going to try to bring it right into perfect focus and connection for you. How many of you here have older brothers and sisters? And your older brother or sister's name is? Michael. Michael. How old is he? 19. 19. Michael, 19. Uh, my sister's name is Kaylee, and she's 20. Kaylee is 20. Somebody else? Yes. Craig. Craig is 23. So we have Michael, who's 19, Kaylee, who's 20, and Craig, who's 23. When you see pictures of veterans, at those cenotaphs, on days like today and anniversaries, you see them all as old men and women. They weren't old men and women when they won victory in 1945. They were Michael, 19, Kaylee, 23, Craig, 20. They were young men and women. And I'm going to try to connect you to that time. I want to take you back to the time when Charlie made very important decisions. He saw an airplane like this fly over his home in Guelph, Ontario in 1933. He thought, oh boy, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to fly an aircraft. And he had an opportunity because in 1939, when Canada declared war on Germany, as the rest of the Commonwealth was, he decided that he was going to join the Air Force, he was going to learn how to spot, fly a Spitfire or a Hurricane, he was going to go over to Europe, and he was going to win the war single-handedly. Right? Well, he had to train first. He went into something called the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. And that involved 225,000 young men coming from all over the world to train in Canada. He was just one, there he is in the back row on the right, training to become a pilot. And he graduated through elementary flying training. Can you imagine learning how to fly out of that mud? That's St. Catharines in 1940, and a fleet finch. And he had to learn how to solo in eight hours. After he did that, he learned how to work on a Harvard. This is a twin seated, the instructor in the back, and the student in front, much more powerful, this was the precursor to his Hurricane and Spitfire experience. So he graduated. Look at the smile on his face. This is his wings day. Imagine yourself graduating. Imagine Michael graduating from high school, or Caleb, or Craig. The smile when you get that diploma. That's his diploma, those wings. Because now he's going to go overseas, and he's going to win the war single-handedly. Well, not quite. You see, he graduated so high in his graduating class, they decided to keep him back in Canada. Why? To teach other airmen how to fly. And so he did for three years. He taught about 125 other pilots. He called them my calling cards for Hitler. The young men he would teach to fly as expertly as they could to take the task of taking the air war over Europe. And then he got his chance. Charlie went overseas in 1943, and he was on all those operations finally that changed the war. He flew his first operations on June the 6th, 1944. What was that? D-Day. Why was he concerned? He was flying cover for Canadian troops going in on the shore. Landing there, 15,000 of them. Among them, his older brother Ted, who was going in with the artillery. That gave him great concern and interest in what was going on. He flew against the V-1 and V-2 rocket sites. He flew all the way through to the end of the war. 232 different sorties. And he won two DFCs. He came back. He didn't even want to go to Buckingham Palace when they offered him the chance to go there for the king to pin the two DFCs on him. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to come home and see his family. And so he came back to Guelph, and the people who had employed him prior to that, the people at the Walker store, took him back in his old job selling shoes. 22, 23-year-old selling shoes, a DFC, twice-decorated pilot. I went to visit him. And we explored his past. He was very reluctant, as most veterans are, to talk about his service, to talk about what he had done. Because Canadians aren't proud that way. They don't brag. I went to his pilot's log, and I went through every day in his pilot's log. And I went day by day by day, recounting all the experiences he had in five or six years of flying during the war. And I came across a date, 
July the 17th, 1944, and there's a little red tick next to it. And I asked him about it, and he didn't want to talk about it. I asked him about it again. We had several interviews as I was preparing a book about it. Finally, he relented. He said, on the 17th of July, I was in the air. By this time, Canada, Canadians were in France about eight weeks after D-Day. They were moving farther eastward and towards the liberation of Europe. And he's flying back to his base, and he sees a car racing along a country road in France. And he and the aircraft on the right, with his wingman to his right, swoop down, strafe it, and drive it off the road, because that car looks important. Indeed it was. In that car was none other than the Desert Fox, Erwin Rommel, the most important general in the German army, and he drove him out of the war. Charlie was reluctant to tell that story, never told it until we, the historians, came together to give him the credibility, tell the story accurately, that he had actually done it. And so Charlie was able to proudly explain and exclaim to others that his service included this incredible moment, driving Erwin Rommel out of the war. Again, don't think of that old man next to that aircraft or at the cenotaph. Think of Michael and Kaylee and Craig doing those things. Could they do those things? Could they make responsible decisions? What do you think? She's smiling. He's smiling. No? Yes? They could. Life and death decisions they had to make in those years. Let's go back even further. Anybody recognize this image here? What's that? Vimy Ridge, where Canada came of age in 1917 in four days. Where? Because the Canadians were told to take this ridge in northern France, a ridge that the French and the British had been unable to take for three years and had lost 140,000 troops trying to take it in the First World War. The Canadians were told to take it, and they did. In fact, on the first day, on April the 9th, 1917, they moved right from their positions on their side of no man's land to the top of the ridge in five hours. They were able to achieve which the rest of the world had not been able to in those hours. And the battle began at 5.30 in the morning with the thunder of a thousand guns behind the Canadians. And you may have heard about the creeping barrage where the Canadians used the artillery firing over their heads to march up the ridge with that protection and finally overwhelm the Germans at the top of the ridge in those four days. And here's an image of the Canadians going up that ridge. Look at how they're not running. Look at their posture. Because they walked what was called the Vimy Glide. They were actually walking with a measured walk as the shells landed in front of them going up the ridge on that day, April the 9th, 1917. Now behind the lines were a dedicated group of supply people. This is a dressing station where the wounded were taken. The casualties expected at Vimy on April, between April the 9th and April the 12th, 1917, they expected 60,000 casualties. 60,000, that's probably the population of the entire area we're sitting in, the towns and the cities around here. The fact of the matter is, the Canadians took the ridge with 3,595 dead and another 6,000 wounded. Much less than was expected. Horrible, horrible statistics, but the reality was behind the lines was an incredible chain to make sure the casualties weren't worse. They would go to these dressing stations behind Vimy, and if the wounds were severe enough, they would take them to the railway stations nearby and then ship the men in their cots and, and stretchers to the coast, to a place called a top. And what would a young man who's been at the front for several years now, knowing nothing else but the trenches and the mud and the fighting and the men around him, greeting him there is a female ambulance driver, Grace McPherson among them. Grace McPherson is a great story. She was born and raised in Vancouver. When the war broke out in 1914, she wanted to serve. She wrote the Canadian and, and the British governments and said, I want to serve in the Red Cross. I want to drive an ambulance. They said, sorry, we can't accept you. We won't help you. She saved her money in Vancouver. She got enough money to get passage all the way to England. And she waited her turn to get a chance to get into the Red Cross driving ambulances. And it happened because Sir Sam Hughes, the minister of militia, made some incorrect decisions in terms of purchasing weapons, and he was ousted from his position as the Minister of Militia, and the, the strategy in the First World War changed from having men driving ambulances to allowing women to drive the ambulances so that men could go closer to the front. And so Grace McPherson got her chance. And she has in her diaries, and I read them extensively, and she describes her service, her dedication to this cause, she was there in a top when the first wounded arrived from Vimy, and it's her responsibility to put them in the back of that ambulance. Four men at a time. Take care of them. She talked to them. She said, I don't want you men moaning as we go to the hospital. They drove on these cobblestone roads to the hospitals to deliver them to make sure that they were well. So she talked to them. She was also responsible for maintaining the car 
fixing the flats. All for about 16 or 17 shillings a week, and she did that for two years. And you know what she says in her diaries was her most proud moment? Not that she was serving at Vimy. Not that she was helping young men to survive the war. Not that it was service in the Red Cross. But because the patch on her shoulder said Canada on it, that's what she was most proud of. Grace McPherson. You don't have to be an elderly person to be a veteran. This is Afghanistan. The man in the front of this platoon is Jeff Peck. He's about the same age as I think probably Kaylee. 23, we said? 20. He was 20 in that picture. He's in Afghanistan. He was in Afghanistan in April of 2002 in a training exercise at a place called Tarnak Farms, where, as the exercise began on the ground, here's an image of it, this is Tarnak Farms, the training area. In the nighttime, American pilots thought they were being fired on. Unfortunately, one of them unleashed a 500 pound laser guided bomb on the Canadian training exercise and killed four Canadians. Jeff was there. He was over here somewhere off to the left. He just finished the training exercise. I talked to Jeff. I said, what did you do? It was his job to race to that area to secure it. He didn't know what had happened. He was in Kingston when I interviewed him. Here's an image of him. And we talked. And I said, why are you there? He said, because I wanted to get an education. I wanted to serve my country. I wanted to test myself. I wanted to get a sense of whether I could live up to the expectation of the military, my family, and me. And he was there. His job was to secure the area. He went into that area where his fellow Canadians had been killed and in the dark secured it. They had, um, uh, what are they? They're sort of phosphorus sticks to, to light up the area. Flares? It was their job. No, not flares. They were, they were literally rings of um, phosphorus uh, light. And they allowed them to work in the night and secure the area and to assist those who were wounded, because there were many more than the four killed who needed assistance, to get them out of this area. It was his job to do it. And I asked him later in the interview, I did several interviews with him, I said, Jeff, what did this do to you? He said, it really messed me up. He came back. He was enrolled in uh, Queens at the time. He got out of school, he broke up with his girlfriend. He didn't know what he wanted to do anymore. Today we call it post-traumatic stress disorder. He didn't know what it was initially. But it took a little time, he got back on track. He went back to school, he's now working with JAG in Ottawa. He's got a law degree, he now has a wife and two children. He's got his life back on track because people were around to help him, to make sure that he didn't get lost, that his way wasn't lost in terms of his life and his career, and he's still back in the military. But I asked him finally, I said, Jeff, when did you know that this PTSD had been part of your experience there? He said, it took place about three or four years after the incident at Tarnak Farms with the killing of the Canadians in the, in the uh, training exercise. I said, what happened? He said, well, I was called a liaison officer. I was a captain then, he said, and it was my job to meet the transport aircraft coming back from Afghanistan with the bodies in it. I said, what did you do? He said, it was my job to meet the family and to assist them through that process of meeting the aircraft on the tarmac, getting the family to the location safely, carefully, and with as little um, interference as possible, watch the body come off in the casket, go through the ceremony in the tarmac, see the body put into a hearse, get into a limousine, travel the 152 kilometers from Trenton to Toronto where the body could be handed over to the family beneath those 50 or 60 bridges along the Highway of Heroes in Ontario. That was his job, to make sure the family could do that. And I said, what happened? He said, we left Trenton and the family was weeping in the limousine that he was assigned to. Weeping horribly. Grief, was, of course, it was obvious, it was expected. And he's in there with them. He said, but suddenly, we got to the first bridge. And suddenly, there were people hanging off the bridges with Canadian flags. Paramedics, police officers, firefighters, civilians, other veterans. They didn't necessarily endorse the mission, the operation. They didn't say, yes, we're in favor of this war. But what they were in favor was of the family's loss and the recognition of it. And the need to recognize the young man, in this case it was a Captain Dawes. And I said, what happened to you, Jeff, inside that limousine? He said, when the family saw the people, they were elated. You can see in this picture, they're waving 
at the people on the bridge. They were laughing. They were so excited. They were thrilled to know that a country, that a population, that others in the services cared. And then they left that bridge and went on and made their way all the way down to Toronto. And I said, then what happened? He said, the family descended back into grief and began weeping again. And I wept with them. And he said, that's when I realized I could have been Captain Daw in that box. That's when I realized how powerful this time was of my service in Afghanistan to Canada and the needs of the country and the world at that time. And so, what's the mission, what's the, what's the message in all of this? It's to remember that the young men and women of Canada and the causes that Canadians have been involved in, the gift that they give of their time, their effort, their blood, their sweat, their, their passion, their intellect, to something they feel important in their lives. And at the time, for the people I've shown you, Charlie Fox, Grace McPherson, the ambulance driver, Jeff Peck, that was the most important thing in their lives. That was important to them to get out there and to show what they could do, what they contribute to their country and an important moment in history. So the next time you go to a cenotaph, maybe later today, if you see people parading, recognizing today's VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, 68 years ago, don't think of those people as feeble and graying and balding and tottering. Think about Michael. Think about Kaylee. Think about Craig. And all the Michaels and Kayleys and Craigs in your lives and around you. It's the young people who gave so much in their time put their lives on hold sometimes to say, I'll come back to this. For Charlie, he was coming back to his shoe sales job in 1945. Grace McPherson back to working at the library in Vancouver. For Jeff, going back to his law degree, sorting his life out, making sure that he, what he did was worthwhile. And you can do that. The same way the Michaels and the Cayleys and the Craigs and the people in this room and across this network, however old they are, service is an opportunity. Service is important when you volunteer it, you give it, you believe in it, you learn from it, you grow with it. Thank you.